All right. Good afternoon. Good morning. Good evening, wherever you're at. Thank you so much for joining us uh, for another edition of PostgreSQL. Man, I have a hard time saying that today. PostgreSQL 101. Today, we're going to talk about database monitoring and some ways to think about how to optimize the database or, or information you can get ascertained from various sources to help you optimize and think about ways to make your database, help your database run as good as it can. So my name is Ryan Booz. I'm a product and Postgres advocate here at Redgate, and I'm thrilled to have you here today. And it's been really fun to go through these various months. I think we started back in May or April, just talking about all the various pieces from a beginner perspective um, of what, how to transition into Postgres, some of the things you have to be aware of. And a lot of what we talk about comes from a SQL Server background. So if that's you, hopefully this will make sense to you. You'll see some of those connections and it will be helpful. So again, my name is Ryan Booz. Uh, I, as I said, I'm a Postgres advocate here at Redgate. You can see my contact information. Uh, really, please feel free to reach out to me in any of those areas. Um, X, uh, LinkedIn, uh, blog that gets gets some love every so often. And, and hopefully over the holidays here, we'll get a little bit more. A lot of uh, partially done articles uh, that hopefully will be very helpful. Today, as we said, we're going to talk about database monitoring and some optimization ideas. And uh, for December, we're actually going to take a break because of the holidays, but we have actually put most of these uh, videos online on YouTube. There's a couple places that you can go find them, uh, either on our website or the YouTube channel. So if you have missed some of the ones from the previous months, please consider watching them there. All right, a couple housekeeping things. Number one, the session is being recorded. And so we will share it with anyone who registered first. And then within a couple of weeks or a month or so, I believe we'll probably get this edited and it will get online uh, again in the other places like YouTube and so forth. And then as we go through this session, please ask any questions you have in the Q&A box of the uh, interface you're in. And we'll answer those at the end to the best of my ability. If I don't know the answer, uh, I will attempt to uh, you know find it out for you and get you that answer back if you want to leave contact information or we'll try and find a way to, to make that happen maybe in the follow-up email. So do my best uh, to help you as we work through some of this. So here's the brief agenda for today. So first, I just want to give you an overview of the metrics that are available to you to monitor what's happening in your database, your Postgres database and server, and, and in your queries. And so uh, then we're going to actually look at what does that mean? How do you take all this information and then do something with it? Uh, how do you monitor this over time? And then we'll show you a few brief tools. Again, I, I don't have any specific demos today uh, because there's it, there's a lot. There's a lot of potential options, and I, I don't want to give too much preference to any one of them. Uh, but I want to make you aware of what those options are. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. So the first is database metrics. So there are many statistical views or statistics views within the Postgres database and ecosystem, right? So when you set up a Postgres server, you automatically get these views. Now, if you're coming from something like SQL Server, this is very, very similar or analogous to the dynamic management views. So if you want to get information about tables, or indexes, or just the database itself. There are views specific to those various areas, much like you have been used to in SQL Server. The one thing to know is that, again, there are many. I will say there are not as many as you are probably used to seeing in, again, something like SQL Server. There are a lot of DMVs. But with every release of Postgres, um, there are often new views being added, or if a new view isn't being added, then there's probably a modification to a, a current view. So maybe there's a new feature in the latest version of Postgres. And so there's a new column added to the, the, um, to the stat database uh, view in some way. And so this is something to be aware of. With every release, you'll see reference. They do very good job with the release notes. And you'll often see blog posts when new uh, views and statistic data about the running of Postgres, when it's added to a new version, there's usually a lot of blog posts because it's something that people worked hard on and they're really excited about giving more observability to Postgres. So when you look at those standard views, 
uh, there's almost always going to be the same format. They have the all view, which is everything for every type of that object. So if it's a table, you're going to get both the system tables and your user tables. If you just do the sys view instead, and I'll show you what that looks like in a second, uh, you will get the rows that are returned in that view are only for the system objects that Postgres itself is maintaining in some way, not anything you've done. Or there's the user view. So you really have, and that's just view data rows dealing with user created objects, whether it's tables, views, indexes, or the like. So that's kind of the, the idea of how you get into this, how you see these various things and depends what you want to do. So the standard go-to views that you will see almost anywhere you look at references to how to, to introspect into Postgres and get more information about what's going on, these would be a lot of the views that you'll see. So first there's stat database, and that just gives you really high level overview about things that are happening in the database itself. So there's a, you know, a row for every database, various columns about the size, um, you know, number of connections, all those kinds of things. And then you have PG stat. And again, remember I said, there's going to be three different views for each of these. So all is everything, system and user tables, sys, and then user. Uh, so in this case, tables, they have one for indexes. And then we're going to talk briefly about stat IO. Uh, it's a new view that's been added to Postgres 16, a couple years of work by a number of companies trying to help um, see the, what's the impact of queries at the IO level of the server. And that can really help you understand, you know, queries that are not just slow, but are actually having a measurable impact at the IO level of the server. There's a lot of replication views. Uh, and again, these are views that there are more than what I'm listing here, but these are views that are often used in day-to-day -day work for monitoring what's happening within Postgres. So if you have replication set up, you know, to do failover, maybe to do read-only, uh, you know, read-only servers in some way, uh, copies, you will need to keep track of how replication is working. And again, it depends on how you've set up replication. There are multiple ways to do it in Postgres, both physical and logical. Streaming, I mean, uh, streaming physical or logical. Um, and all of these views help you identify how well that replication is working. If there are, um, you know, follow-on servers, there are, uh, uh, the words that gave me right now, the, the secondary servers, there we go, secondary servers that maybe are falling behind because something has happened. Uh, all of that can be ascertained through, through these views and really helpful. You'll see them referenced often. So let's quickly go through these just to give you an idea of, of what you can get and, and what some of the value of these are. And I'm going to show you a screenshot from uh, one of the applications that can help you visualize this data. So PG stat database, as I said, is kind of the high level statistics for each database, things like transaction counts, uh, you know, blocks. So how, how many blocks are used from cache or disk? So, um, you know, how, how often does a query or does a system have to pull pages off disk to satisfy a query because there wasn't room in cache maybe in some way. And then just basics, you know, again, we're not talking tables, we're talking total database, how many rows are inserted, updated, deleted, deadlocked, sessions. There, there's a number of other rows here, but this can give you a really quick idea of, you know, kind of the, the overall work that's happening on a database. If there's lots of pages being pulled off disk to satisfy queries, if that ratio between pages used from cache and pages used from disk is out of proportion in a lot of disk reads, then something's happening in that database or in the server that's preventing those pages from being cached. And so you're probably experiencing a database that is not performing as you would expect or you would hope. Next, we have the tables views. And again, most of the time, you will probably use the user view of this, PG stat user tables. And that will give you just the tables that you've created. That's usually what you are looking for. It, those are the tables that satisfy, are using the queries that satisfy things you need for your applications, your reports, and so forth. Um, and again, there's a lot of similarity because we're talking about things like, uh, and again, I've said this in previous webinars, uh, tuples or tuples, however you want to say it, really is, is a row. Uh, now, there's a kind of technical definition of why we call it a tuple rather than a row within Postgres, but... As far as we're concerned, they're basically synonymous here. So at the table level, this becomes where it's, you can start to identify tables that maybe are inefficient in some way. 
This is where you can start to identify, for instance, tables that maybe are missing an index, right? So if there are a lot of uh, table scans, uh, if there are a lot of seek scans, so those are that were in in SQL Server terms, that would literally be scanning the whole table to find rows to satisfy a query. Well, if you have a high number of seek scans and a low number of um, you know, index scans, or basically the table scan to show you what's happening, it probably means you're missing an index somewhere, right? So there's just a lot of work happening on that table. Things like vacuum and auto vacuum, that was last month's webinar. Right, So we need to know how often, when was the last time vacuum ran on this table? If you have a very active table and auto vacuum hasn't kicked in regularly and that, that vacuum date is a week or two weeks ago, something's misconfigured. This stuff is not readily available for you to just pull out in some dashboard within Postgres. You have to get the information out of these views. Um, so just knowing kind of where we're at, within the tables helps to identify tables that are inefficient, that might be taking more space than they need, that are doing more work than you would expect or that is needed to satisfy your queries. And all that comes with things like knowing the, the state of all your tuple work, you know which ones are dead, which ones are live, how many updates have there been, and what we call hot updates, which is a more efficient way of updating rows. Going back to MVCC and auto vacuum from last month, go watch that webinar. So really, really helpful view to be integrated with some of the other views here, but this is probably one of the areas that you'll really start to hone in on when you start to understand that I have queries or I have a table that seems really big. This database has gotten big and I can't quite figure out why. This is probably gonna be one of the areas that you're going to look towards. Now using just something like the tables view, this is SQL Monitor from Redgate, and we are able to you know, identify just the size of a table um, you know, how, what we call reusable space, the dead tuples. So these are the ones that have been deleted or updated rows that have deleted current rows. Again, all of this goes back to last month's webinar on MVCC. We can visualize this and start to see, oh man, this table is really growing quickly. We didn't expect this thing to be, you know, 35, 40 gigabytes large. What happened? Why is this the case? Now, if this is a, a real database, um, I mean, a real application, I would probably, you know, notice we are in November and I would say, oh man, auto vacuum or vacuum has not run in this table since October 8th. That's, that's five weeks ago. I know that can't be good for my database. I know I've learned that with MVCC, auto vacuum, vacuuming a table is a really necessary process. And so things like that, we can pull out just from that one view uh, and really start to understand how disk space and our server and our application that the table space is being used here. Then we move on to indexes. Now, again, here you're going to see if you do user indexes and you can filter by table, things like that, you'll be able to see really essential things here. This is how we start to understand the indexes that are being used well, indexes that are not being used, um, and, and then how the data is being fetched. So how many scans of an index has happened, right? So we want indexes to be used. So if we have an index that hasn't been accessed ever or very infrequently, it's probably an unused index, or maybe it's a duplicate of another index, and you can start to identify that together. And then there are queries that we can run to identify indexes that appear to be duplicates. You know, the last time an index was scanned, if, if you're sampling this data every couple minutes, every couple seconds, maybe once a day, and you see that, oh, there have been scans, but it happens once a day. Okay, well, maybe that's a special index for a special query somewhere. And again, you can start to understand the activity and the usefulness of your indexes and identify, is there something that can, you know, when I merge this or reference this to a table, are the things I can do to improve the query performance uh, and, the, and the usage of my Postgres database. And then kind of the last big one that has been added in Postgres 16 that I mentioned earlier, and again, all of these come with Postgres by default. Now the PGStat.io is new in Postgres 16, and there might be some platforms like Azure SQL, AWS, RDS, some of them might not specifically provide this yet. And the reason is 
Stat.io is meant to help you see what's happening at a query level with IO related work at the back end. And so some of those solutions like Amazon Aurora Postgres has redone how the storage works behind the scenes. So there might not be a one-to-one -one correlation. And I'm sure that team, I actually haven't checked because they just released Postgres 16 on, RD, on RDS like a week ago, and I just haven't had a chance. Um, so some of this might not be there. I know those teams. I know they're working hard. I'm sure they will provide opportunities to allow this to be helpful. The, the nice thing here is, again, rather than just at a database level, so if you recall, the database view showed us, for instance, how many pages in total are being pulled off a disk or used out of cache within this database. But here we can actually get to the query and see for this query, what is the usage of our, of our cache? Um, things like checkpointing. So that is where we are able to say when a modification happens, a checkpoint is what flushes that work from memory to disk to make it, uh, you know, uh, re, uh, available and, and uh, durable over time within our database. So there's a lot of, of, this is a first go. They've been working maybe the last two years on this view, uh, this extension really that it provides this view, but it's, there's more work being done. You'll see a lot of opportunity in using PGStat.io as another opportunity for really understanding how things are working at the database. All right, so that is the server level. That's where, you know, again, we're used to in SQL Server. We we kind of can track the size of our database. We want to know, you know, which tables, which indexes seem to be just taking up space or they're not being used or being used a lot. Um, those are the views that help you kind of get an insight into the database itself. But if you want to actually get to the query, which is really where we often want to get to, right? We we know that a query is running slow, or we know that something's happening right now on our server. We know the server's slow. We assume it's probably because of work that's being done right now. How do we view the queries that are running right now? How do we view the queries that maybe we didn't know are running 50,000 times an hour? We didn't know that query was running that often, or we didn't know that this one query for a report has just gotten slower over time because it's it doesn't have the right index and it's scanning this table that's getting larger and larger and larger, and we just weren't aware of it. So that's where we need to start to dig into this uh, query statistics in the um, themselves. So the way that most application, most uh, providers, most people using Postgres do this is with the view PG stat statements. So this was added in Postgres 8.4, and it is an extension. So I've said this before, the Postgres community does not enable some of these things like default. And really that is a mentality that says, we don't believe as the open source developers of Postgres that we should enforce or we should force you to potentially get a small uh, level of you know uh, performance overhead by tracking this data. And so we think it's valuable, it's not going to cause you issues most likely, but we don't feel like we have the right to force that on you. And so they provide it as an extension. Uh, but everyone should have this enabled. Every hosting provider that I know of at this point enables this by default and it is available for you to install in your databases. So uh, what it does is it, it, you know, some ways it has to be configured. This is very easy to find online. And again, if you are a hosted, if you're using a hosting provider, this is all done for you already. You just have to install the extension most likely to actually get started. Uh, it tracks the aggregated statistics of all queries in your cluster. Now there are thresholds you can track how many queries uh, it saves values for, maybe just the last thousand. And after you get a thousand uh, versions of uh, you know queries, it will start to kick older queries out and so forth. Um, and then the other thing to notice here is technically, these statistics are actually being tracked. What the extension allows you to do is, is kind of turn it on in a way that it can then create a view out of it. And so the view you can install into every database. When you say create extension PG stat statements, what you're getting is a view in that database that you can query to get this information out. I'm going to show you in a minute what's in that, what's in that view. However, uh, it is permission aware. So 
uh, if you could install it in just one database, maybe you are the admin for your server, you could just install PGStat statements in, say, the Postgres database that no one else is using, and you will be able to see as an admin, as a super user, the queries from all databases. However, if a user installs this into their database and they don't have permission to someone else's database, there will be a row for that database, but it will simply say insufficient privileges. So they can't see anything about the query because this is kind of a global view at the database level, but it is very much permission aware. Then the other one I want to mention, if you manage your own Postgres database, and there are a couple of hosting providers that are doing this now, uh, PGStat Kcache is an open source contribution from the community. Um, and it is kind of a precursor to what I believe PGStat.io will eventually be. This is really uh, melding the query itself with what's happening under the covers at the IO level and, and the system level. So how much CPU was used for this query? That doesn't happen automatically with the PGStat statements views. You know, how many uh, reads were done out of cache and disk for this statement? Uh, so some of those things happen. And again, the only thing I'll say is because it requires access at a deeper level, a lot of hosting providers don't yet provide PGStat Kcache. Some do. And so if you happen to use a, a provider that gives you maybe your own personal VM and they manage it for you, you may have access to this. And so there's a lot of good documentation, a lot of good examples on how to use this data in correlation with PGStat statements to really dig deeply into your queries. So I wanted to mention that because it's, it can be really helpful if you have access to it. So now let's look at uh, PG stat statements because this is what most people are going to use day to day to debug their uh, application. So it stores aggregates based on the database ID, the user ID and the query ID. So the query ID is a hash based on a parameterized version of that query. I'll show you in just a second. And then the stats are, are grouped together again, uh, kind of as the final ID from this hash. So you can, uh, you know, you could have a query that is very, very similar, but maybe dynamically you're adding a different where clause to an otherwise static query in your app somehow. Well, you'll end up with multiple query hashes because it's very similar to SQL Server. We're hashing the actual text of the query. And so if you modify the where clause, you get a different hash, uh, even after, after it has been parameterized. So just recognize that. This is what I mean by parameterization. You know, the engine under the covers will take something like select ID and name from this table, and it will replace that ID equals with a parameter. And so now we can hash that string. And anytime a query comes through that has that exact form, but maybe a different value, it gets lumped into the statistics for that query. Again, you could have something like an in clause with multiple, um, you know, parameters, multiple uh, IDs or, or values you're looking for. Um, so uh, there we go. Apologize, there's a fire truck going by and uh, distracting me for a second. Um, PG stat statement statistics. So these are all of the things, these are smattering of the things that are tracked. I'll show you a few of these and just on the next slide. Um, but we at the query level now, we can see the execution time and all the, the variance of it, the total. So for this query, the total execution time, uh, you know, uh, cumulatively, since some reset value of, of these statistics. Uh, we'll talk about that in just a second. Planning time. So this is really valuable to know if, you know, maybe a query executes pretty quickly, but it still runs one, two, three seconds every time. And maybe something about this query or it uses a lot of partitions maybe causes that query to take a long time to plan. And it just means that you have to filter it differently because you're, you're forgetting something about maybe the partitions you're using. How many times this query has been called in this form? Number of rows that have been returned and so forth. You know, buffers, as we've talked about in the past, buffers are what uh, we would probably refer to as kind of like the IO, the pages within SQL Server. And again, this is saying for this query to be satisfied, I had to read data off of 8K pages, how many came out of cache, which is fast, how many had to be pulled in from disk to cache for us to use. And anytime you pull from disk, you end up with a slower query. And then wall is our uh, transaction log. So, you know, again, how much work was done against the transaction log to satisfy this query? Let's say it's an insert or an update or a delete. 
as of Postgres 16, there are currently 43 columns of data in that are returned with PGStat statements. Now, I will say just in the last three versions of Postgres, this went from about, I think the last time I counted in Postgres 14, there were maybe uh, 34 columns. So we have added a number of columns over the last couple of versions. And some of that's because folks have said, hey, we need to know, for instance, the last time this query was run. And I believe that's one of the new columns. So you can identify, hey, this looks like this query is used a lot. Oh, but it was only the last time it ran was last night at you know 1 a.m. Oh, so it's a nightly query. Maybe it does a lot of work, but it only happens in the middle of the night. And that's okay for us. This is a, again, this is only a portion of the, the values, but this is what data would come back when you query this view. So I have a query, I see the text. Uh, if planning is turned on, if I'm tracking planning time in my Postgres settings, those values would be set up. I can see execution time, how many times has been called and so forth. And from here, I can start to ascertain, you know, how efficient is this query? Is it pulling from cache? Is it pulling from disk all the time? Uh, how many rows are being modified? How often is wall being, uh, mod you know, uh, tr uh, changed in some way for this query to execute? And as I've referenced a number of times, the, the tricky part with PG stat statements, everyone understands PG stat statements. They see maybe a, 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 a presentation like this. Say, oh, yay, I can finally figure out what's happening with my queries. But we forget that in Postgres, there is nothing built in by default like we might experience in SQL Server, something like Query Store, where we can see the progression of statistics over time. That doesn't exist by default in Postgres. Uh, low hint, that's what we're going to talk about next. All statistic, statistics in PG stat statements and most of the other views are cumulative, and they only reset when the server restarts. And with the newer versions of Postgres, there's actually now a permission and a view, a, a procedure that allows a super user to reset the, the statistics. And, and why might you do this? Well, if you aren't tracking these statistics over time and suddenly you end up with a server that's overloaded, you probably you know, are going to log in and query PG stat statements. When you do that, you might see a query that looks like it's taking a lot of work, but you have no idea if that work has been cumulative over the last couple months because your server's been up that long, or it is the thing that's happening right now. And so the only way to really ascertain that if you haven't been tracking it over time is to reset the values right now and then sample it every few seconds or every minute to find those queries that are taking the work. So that's why you might want to reset it, but you also have to be aware that it is reset every time the server restarts. And so if that happens and you lose your statistics because uh, you weren't sampling them, that could be challenging. A couple of changes that happened recently with PG stat statements. Um, so one of them is that in Postgres 13 and above, uh, if you used this view from Postgres 12 or below, there are a couple names specifically around planning that have changed uh, just to be more in line with the rest of the, the other naming schemes in that view. And so some of your queries might need to be modified if you had been using this in some way. In Postgres 14, uh, up until Postgres 14, the way that the query hash was uh, computed was actually done by a, an outside library kind of in the C uh, program of Postgres. And so uh, that made it challenging to use the same query hash across all of the different places we can see the query plan. And so in Postgres 14 and above, Postgres itself will now compute that hash so that the hash ID can be used in various places that uh, allow us to correlate. I see this happened here. I can maybe go to the logs and track every time that query has been run and see when something changed. And then the other thing it did, which was really helpful, is it actually gave us this column to show us when was the last time the statistics were reset. So we have an idea of what's going on there. <clears throat> All right. So that is getting into the, the query statistics themselves. So now we've Looked at the views that help us identify things within the, the, the database and the tables and the indexes, where to go find some of that information. Uh, we've looked at PG stat statements, how to actually go get information about the queries that are being run. But there's some other stuff that I would expect to be able to see. And again, if I come from SQL Server, there's usually a, a GUI in SSMS or an external application that helps us 
you know, a surface this data in some way because it's just available in SQL Server. Well, it's not always the case with Postgres. So one of the main ways that you can get runtime information is through the actual logs that are uh, persisted with Postgres. So if you're hosted in something like Azure or AWS, there's probably a place you can go. Um, I know there is that you can go and actually see the hourly logs for your running Postgres instance. There's usually things you can configure that say, what's the format you want? Uh, how do you want to see errors? Do you want to see query plans? All of those things can be added into the log, but then you have to do something to actually get that information out of the log. Cause I'm going to show you in a second, logs are not easy to, to, to read and to, really dig into. As I said, there's no default, you know, GUI graphical interface somewhere for you to kind of magically parse this information. You know, we've gotten used to that in, in things like SQL Server. The tooling has been developed over a long time to help you dig in and uh, really, you know, see what's happening within your system. So that means that if you want to get information out of the logs, and there's a lot of good information to get, you need some kind of external process or maybe an extension that can take that data, scrape the logs and process them into something meaningful. So there are a couple of solutions that I'll, I'll show you and then we'll go actually look at a, at a couple quick uh, screenshots and just where they exist. So the first is PG Badger. It's been around for a number of years and uh, developed, I believe uh, maybe by the, I think by someone at Crunchy Data, it's a Postgres company or someone that used to be at Crunchy Data. It's a really powerful log processor. And I'm going to show you in the next screen just really quickly what it can produce. Uh, but basically, it takes the logs that you provide it, it parses it and knows everything about the various things that are included in a Postgres log, and it will produce an HTML report. And recently, if you happen to be using a load balancer, or PG Bouncer, so by default, Postgres does not have any kind of load balancing built into it. You need an external load balancer. PG Bouncer is one of the most popular. And so uh, PG Badger can actually pull in the logs from this load balancer, PG Bouncer, and add additional detail to its output report. So it is a command line tool. You have to have access to your logs. But again, a number of hosted providers actually have documentation on a way that you can use something like PG Badger, getting access to the logs on your system so that you can get this data out. So what it produces generally is a, a really full-fledged report about everything it's, it can find inside of those uh, log files. If you are logging queries, there's a queries tab. It will show you how many times there's been some kind of deadlock, the kind of events that you can see. What are the, the main, how many queries are happening at any one time? Um, so this is, it's a static, you know, it's a report that's created. So it's not dynamic in that sense. Uh, but it's really helpful to really dig into what's happening uh, at some point in time. So maybe something happened yesterday. You can take PG Badger, the log file from yesterday, and you can you know start to create reports that might help you more than what you might get through your hosting provider. The other one that I talk about a few times. Uh, so Letitia is is a Postgres expert out of France. Uh, I think I've referenced her stuff before. She has a lot of talks on PSQL, the command line. Uh, query interface to Postgres. So she actually created an extension, I think a little more than two years ago that will read the log file as a foreign table. So when you create, it's an extension. When you add this extension to your database, it creates a new schema for PG log, and then it will actually set up what we call foreign tables. So a, a table uh, that we can do this in SQL server as well with um Polybase, you know, looking at something in a different format, you know, connecting to an Oracle server or something like that. And so uh, you do have to have permission, whatever user's running this, to actually read the files in that directory, in the log directory. Again, good documentation on how to do that. But then what it will do is create these kind of dynamic tables that process the data. So now you can run some actual queries on them. So I was going to show you briefly. Um, this was, oh, I meant to show you, this is PG Badger. So I, I had the URL on that slide. It's just the GitHub uh, repo for this. There's a lot of, it lists all the various things that it will show you if that information is available in your logs. Again, Letitia has a, a page for her PG log extension. You know, various things, queries. So these tables like PG uh, log, the error analyzed fatal or the error report, those are 
foreign tables that have been created by this extension so that you can query them uh, and get this information out. All right. So we have views for looking at database tables indexes. We have views for digging into queries that has start to help us surface what queries are, are you know, maybe impacting this, the performance of our database right now. Well, then how do we actually get at this? If we don't want to always be doing SQL all the time, what are some ways that we can harness the value of all this data and actually help us do our job a little bit more effectively uh, rather than spending lots and lots of time digging in manually? So first off is to be effective at any of this, we have to have a tool that will do data aggregation in some way. And so nearly all, as I've said before, nearly all of the statistics we've even reviewed today are cumulative, right? So if I query a view or a statistics view in some way, I'm getting a total value for each of those metrics as of right now. If I query it in five more seconds, those values are probably going to change. So I don't know, unless I'm taking those samples every so often, which of the tables, the indexes, the queries are the ones that are doing work right now. So it's hard to identify that unless I'm sampling it. So I need to have a tool that will sample this for me, store the data in some aggregated fashion that makes it easy to query and get value out of. So you can do this manually. Uh, actually, a couple of years ago, I gave a talk using time scale of how to do this in a rudimentary way, but I'm not gonna lie, it's, it's a lot of work. Um, and then you're on the hook for maintaining this process through multiple versions and so forth. And so there are many open source options. I'll, I'll show you a few in just a minute. And then the last thing to say, I'm going to show you a, a log file in just a minute. You probably notice I haven't really talked much about actual query plans and how to identify, you know, hey, this is a query that's slow. Can I see the plan? Again, right now in Postgres, the standard, you know, install, the open source install, there is nothing like query store like we would be used to in SQL Server. And so I can't see how a query plan changes over time magically or automatically in some way. I can log query plans to the log if they maybe reach a threshold. So any query that's slower than 50 milliseconds, log that query plan, and then I can pull that query plan out to do an analysis on it if I see this query is consistently taking a long time. So you will need to use an extension called Auto Explain. Again, this is available with. Postgres, it is available, as far as I know, in every hosted solution, Azure, Amazon, uh, Google, there's all of them provide ways to enable auto explain so that your query plans will be logged so that you can see them. And I'll show you that in just a second. If the tool helps you to see them, that's, that's kind of the trick. So here are a couple of open source options. I'm going to show you one or two of them just really briefly, their websites, so you can see what we're talking about. Um, PG admins, so that is a tool. It's an IDE that many people use. I, I said this at a uh, pre-con at past summit a couple weeks ago. PG admin is actually not the official uh, IDE of Postgres. It just happens to be a tool that's been around a long time. It is maintained by one of the main companies that have maintained Postgres uh, for, for a very long time called EDB, but it's not the official one, but there's a lot of features in it. So if it works for you, there are some uh kind of graphical views that will help you introspect into some of these statistics on your tables and, and so forth. So that other IDEs will provide some level of introspection on this data. There are a number, I say a number, I feel like almost every month, a new open source, typically Grafana based tool comes to market as it were to help you see into these views over time. So a couple might be PG watch or PG dash. Uh, those are maintained by members of the community. I believe each of them, uh, you know, have an open source version, or you can pay them to actually sample and store the data. Might get you some more information. PG Stat Monitor is another extension that provides an enhanced view on top of PG Stat statements. So it kind of takes over where PG Stat statements left off, and it gets you a lot more information at the query level, uh, and it tracks it over time in tables within the database. And so that might be a way to get started. And then I've seen recently a number of open source tools that people have created, often Python based. The problem with these is they are, they're kind of static, right? You have to set them up to run on an interval to get the data and the reports that you get 
are generally pretty static reports. You don't, um, it, it's kind of like that HTML, HTML report from PG Badger. So you have to have a way to actually get the report, see it over time. Uh, so you can find them. I don't typically use them because I believe there are better options, uh, even within the open source set. And we also have things like AWS, Azure, Google. They do provide some level of graphical interface. They're storing some of this information for you over time. Some of them have things like weight statistics. That is one of the things we didn't talk about today because um, it, it's a little bit unique in Postgres, and it's something that's really now just getting a lot of traction within the community. So maybe that would be a, a webinar in 2024 we can do and talk about weight statistics and how that can help you. So uh, just to show you a couple of these really briefly, uh, this is um, PG Watch. It's maintained by, it's an open source offering maintained by a company called Cybertech. Uh, we had a, a gentleman from Cybertech actually join us at Past Summit, gave a great talk and really good community member. Um, so you can install this and use it. There's instructions, it's open source, but they actually do provide services to help you run it if you would prefer that. But this is what you'll see often in a lot of open source tooling for Postgres. So Grafana is a very heavily relied upon tool. Uh, there's a lot of ways to view what's going on over time, a lot of different graphs. In this case, um, this specific uh, version has lots and lots of dashboards that are pre-made for you. You know, PG stat statements top. I don't know if they have anything in here currently. And okay, they do have a few. So this might be a way to see some stuff that's happening within PG stat statements uh, at the moment. So there's a lot of opportunity, but it takes a lot of effort to roll around, but it might be a starting place. There's things like uh, RDS. So if you have RDS Azure, you're going to have some kind of graphs that look like this, uh, that you can you know, see what's happening under the covers. You can click on a query um, and see you know, what's happening underneath. And this is probably not going to give me much. I, I didn't have an opportunity to actually uh, generate more data out of this. This is a sample database uh, that we've been using. Um, but you'll see it's called Performance Insights. Azure has something similar. So this is a way to start, but I will tell you that there's a limitation on what, you, it's very hard to configure this to be really useful on an application by application basis. So there really is a need to use something outside of just these interfaces within uh, the, the hosting providers that you are using. And so some of those options, you know, certainly become paid. And I've said this a lot. There are, it's a trade-off time and value. And uh, we have gotten used to tooling in something like SQL Server that's generally pretty good and free built into the tools to get you started. And then we know of a number of tools that are kind of standard within the community to dig deeper. So Redgate SQL Monitor has been well-loved by a lot of people in SQL Server community. And we've really made a, an effort to bring in Postgres to that offering. I showed you a screenshot earlier, uh, and I'll show you that in just a second. How we are trying to bring the same kind of overview, the same look, the same information to bear on Postgres because it's it's not available without effort. And so, uh, you know, looking at a tool like SQL Monitor could really be a value uh, to help you focus on what you need to focus on and not trying to manage and maintain this monitoring solution. PG Analyze is used by a lot of folks. Um, it's kind of a, it's a hosted solution. So it's 100% for fee. There's there's no way to, to do anything open source with it. Um, the gentleman has done a lot for the community, and it's it's worth checking out if you have a couple databases. Um, again, if you have more than one database engine, like SQL Server and Postgres, PG Analyze isn't going to help you. It's only going to help with the Postgres space. So maybe finding a tool like SQL Monitor that can do multiple database engines allows you to stick in one area, look at things like alerting consistently across all of your databases. And then there's a lot of polyglot tools. You know, I say polyglot meaning... These are monitoring tools that do all kinds of things, right? They're not just database monitoring tools. They do have a lot of information for databases, whether it's SQL Server or Postgres, uh, but that's not their main focus. And so you'll often find that, or at least we have found with our clients that, that you're going to pay a lot of money to, to store data, but you're not always going to get the full value out of it. But if you use one of these tools, it might be a place to start to see what is possible and, and what the, the, the cost might be. Give them a look. 
talk to the company, see what they're doing. So Datadog is very popular. Procona is uh, really focused on open source databases uh, and, and providing services. They do a lot in uh, really across the world in providing both help to the communities and help to clients to manage these open source databases. They have their own monitoring tool also built on top of Grafana. Uh, so you can check that out, Solar Winds and so forth. So again, what you're looking for, hopefully, is something that can you know look very familiar to what you're used to. So this is SQL Monitor. It's a Postgres database. It's a uh, actually currently in our EC2 instance. We can also do RDS and, and uh, Aurora. And you know we get to down to seeing, hey, here's the query. This one has been run the most. How many seconds has it been run in that total time that we're looking at? Again, if you use the right tool and you're logging things like query plans, well, then you can actually see a visual query plan. Like we can take what was spit out as the actual query plan from um, the, 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 the planner into the log. And we can start to give you some visual uh, representation like you might be used to with SQL Server, right? We're so used to being able to say, show me the query plan and get this nice graphical plan. That doesn't exist in Postgres unless you have a tool that will do it for you. You'll see all the information about each of these nodes, the work that was done throughout the whole query plan to see you know, where some inefficiencies might be. So taking that, finding a tool that will show you all these little pieces of information over time, tracking it for you, you don't have to actually do it yourself, can be really beneficial. All the way down to things like vacuum, which is what we talked about last month, seeing how active our database is, how much space is being freed up for, for use with new data, dead tuples, things like that. So it's really worth um, you know, investing, looking at a tool that can help you, you know, get more value out of these views. The views are awesome. There's a lot of examples, ways to use them. Start to query them, see what the possibilities are. Uh, but as you need to dig, as your, your, um, you know, your topology of your, uh, of your system grows, you have more and more instances of Postgres, you're going to want to have help. And so checking out some of these tools would be really helpful for you to be more efficient in how you monitor. So we are at the end of the presentation. We have about 10 minutes. If there are any questions, um, the team will pass them over to me, I believe. And so I'll wait for a minute. All right, so first question here is, you called out PGStat Kcache as an open source uh, from the community. I thought that all Postgres was open source and community developed and supported. Am I wrong? Oh, great question. Um, Postgres is open source. What open source means, anybody can take anything in Postgres. They can take the database engine. They can build it into and call it something new, and they could sell it. There's nothing stopping anyone from doing that. Open source just means everyone is... There's the opportunity. Anyone can use the source code. In this case, anyone can really do whatever they want as long as they reference that it's Postgres open source. Um, and so extensions, there are many open source extensions, but there are a lot of extensions that are not. So PG Analyze is one I referenced. That is actually an extension you install in your Postgres instance, um, or it can be. There, there are ways for PG Analyze to use just the built-in extension, but you can get more functionality if you can install PG Analyze. But it's only useful if you're paying for PG Analyze. And that's totally fair game, right? That is, that's what open source is about. We're contributing to it. We would love you to contribute back. But if you just want to go ahead and use it and do something with it, that's great. So uh, you will find that many, many, many extensions are open source, free to use, free to modify. Uh, but again, something like PGStack Kcash, because it's looking and working at a deeper level, it might not be available everywhere because of how some of the platforms like Azure, Amazon, and so forth are actually developed. They use Postgres, but they have modified some things like how storage is done. That's what allows them to be scalable. So hopefully that helps. Question two for AWS RDS. Since the PostgreSQL comp file is not accessible, what is the alternative? Ha ha. So in something like RDS, and the same thing happens in Azure, uh, they actually do give you access to most of those parameters. In Amazon, it is called um, parameter groups. So you can look that up. And basically you can set, you have to create your own parameter group. They create one for you by default. But if you want to override the default parameters, things like auto explain, you can create your own parameter group 
and apply it to each of your databases, and it will use those values. So you don't get access to all of the settings in the postgresql.com file, but you get access to many of them. And so I, I will say this, both Amazon and Azure, and I'm sure Google too, do a pretty good job documenting all of these features, what you can and can't turn on and enable within the PostgreSQL comp file. So if you want to use something, check it out, see if that provider you're using gives you access. Uh, so another question, we don't have Postgres at work yet. I use it on my home servers. Is there a reduced cost or free version of Redgate SQL Monitor that I can use for home lab for learning? I don't believe there is. Uh, we do offer a free trial. Uh, I would encourage you to reach out to the team. That is truly not my not my part of the business. Uh, it, it, generally, we don't. It is a for fee product because uh, there's a lot of work going into it. And so we are trying to make it usable for everybody in a, in a way. But feel free to reach out. Uh, I don't want to speak fully for the team, but hopefully that helps. All right. And I will say this, uh, I'll just show you for, for Regate SQL Monitor, uh, we actually have it online. You can just go to monitor.red-gate.com uh, and you can actually see, um, I have, there we go, man, I, that was off. You can actually see lots of versions. We have SQL versions, we have RDS, we have Aurora, both in SQL Server and Postgres, uh, all kinds of different you know, versions of Windows Edge and other things, things that you can look at here. So uh, managed instances, lots and lots of opportunity to see what Regate Monitor will do. All right. Are there any other questions? It looks like maybe there's one more coming in. Um, all right. It looks like we're done for now. So hopefully that's been helpful. Let's give you an overview of how you can start to get this information out of Postgres because it's there and it's available but just to start to make the correlation from what you might know in something like SQL Server to what you need to go find in Postgres. So, you know, there are articles we've already, some have been written already on Regate blog. There are many articles across the, the internet, quite honestly, about how to query these uh, views more effectively. It's a lot to get into. And my goal today was to help you see where the data is. Um, again, maybe in a future webinar, we can actually talk some specific queries and show you how to correlate those different views, that just gets pretty deep uh, and it, it's hard to get through too much in a, in a one hour webinar. So hope this has been helpful. If you have other questions, again, um, showed you how to you know get in contact with me at the beginning of this, uh, just Ryan Booz, almost anywhere you can find me, both on uh, X, on LinkedIn and so forth. And um, look forward to hearing from you again. So again, catch up with the series. You'll get information uh, as we get ready for the new year of when the next edition of Postgres 101 will be. Um, but we look forward to seeing you then. Hope you have a great uh, end of your year, holiday season, and we'll talk to you soon. Take care.